a solemn reminder of the dark days of Russia's past. The Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces commemorating Defender of the Fatherland Day, which honors war veterans and all Russians who lost their lives defending their country. Prior to the wreath-laying ceremony by the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers near the Kremlin, President Vladimir Putin released the video message to the nation, but with a clear warning for the world. I want to repeat, Russia's interests and the security of our people are an indisputable priority. So we will continue to strengthen and modernize our army and navy, striving to increase their effectiveness so that they fit it out with the most cutting-edge equipment. An independent polling group says the majority of Russians believe their president. Over 50% of people surveyed at the start of the Ukraine crisis back in December believe the United States and NATO countries are responsible for increasing tensions. Events like this to honor fallen soldiers are taking place across the country, but this year's events are particularly poignant as the threat of war in Ukraine overshadows a day that's dedicated to remembering the human cost of war. Most here say the thought of war is simply unimaginable. I wouldn't like the war to start. I'd like all political powers to make efforts to avoid war. And we really hope there will be no war. And it looks like at the end of the day there will be no war. I think there will be no war. Nobody needs war, neither Ukraine nor Russia. As a rule, these are politicians who start wars. They are the only ones who need wars. I think that we are all Slavic people, Ukrainians and Russians. Do you need war? I don't need it. Why would young guys die? People, children, parents, mothers, fathers. I think that common sense will prevail. Putin says Russia is always open for direct and honest dialogue but has full confidence in the military. A military that will likely include a new generation of Russians who have never ventured far from home, but must now prepare themselves for the possibility that they could one day be back here, just not as visitors paying their respects to unknown soldiers. A dark and sobering thought on a day meant to remind the country of the senselessness of war. Dorsu Jabari, Al Jazeera, Moscow. Well, let's look at how the military strengths of Russia and Ukraine compare. Ukraine has about 209,000 active military personnel, but Russia has about four times that number, with more than 900,000 active service members. And when it comes to their reserves, Ukraine has another 900,000 trained to a military standard. But again, they're outnumbered by Russia, which has about 2 million. Onto military equipment, Russia is clearly a superior force, with more tanks, armored vehicles and artillery than the Ukrainian side. When it comes to air power, the story is the same. Russia also has about 15 times the number of fighter jets, and all of Ukraine's current fleet was built during the Cold War. Russia's anti-aircraft system, the S-400, is said to be one of the strongest defense systems in the world. While Ukraine's own anti-aircraft system is largely outdated, the country has received a significant amount of anti-aircraft missiles from Latvia and Lithuania. Well, joining us now from Washington, D.C., is Charles Kupchan. He is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a professor of international affairs at Georgetown University. Thanks very much uh, for being with us. So, um, on paper, it would seem that uh, uh, Ukraine is very much outnumbered and outmatched here uh, from a military uh, standpoint. So, uh, what, what are its options uh, at this point if, if a, a larger conflict were to break out? Well, I think your description is pretty accurate. And in some ways, the numbers hide the degree of mismatch. And that's simply because the Russian military is not just bigger, but it's better. It has much better equipment. It's trained to higher standards. Even though the Ukrainian army is much better than it was in 2014, it would not be able to stop Russia if Russia decides to invade. I think what we're seeing here by calling up reservists, by getting more support from outside, is an effort to deter Russia by telling Putin that if you invade, it will be a bloody affair. The costs will be high. But in my mind, the biggest deterrent to Putin right now is not necessarily the war itself, but what comes after. Does he really want to invade and occupy a country of 44 million people and deal with 
a grassroots insurgency that's likely to follow. That's a much bigger bite than the actual invasion itself. There's also the issue, isn't there, of how this would play in Russia. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if you heard our correspondent's report there, but there was a sense there among many ordinary Russians that they don't want this to go into a full-blown uh, uh, conflict and, and, and to see uh, more, more Russians and Ukrainians uh, dying. This is something that would not, that would not play well uh, back home in Russia. Is that um, a deterrent? As, uh, would that be acting as a, a deterrent uh, as well as in, in Putin's thinking? Yes, and that's why the Ukrainian effort, NATO's effort to raise the costs matters, because Putin is doing a cost-benefit analysis now. Most of his actions to date in his neighbors, in Georgia, in Moldova, in Nagorno-Karabakh, even in Syria, have been relatively limited, not that many Russian casualties. If there are lots of body bags coming home, that could make the story quite different. And you have to keep in mind that the West is going to impose very significant, severe sanctions against Russia that will affect the quality of life in Russia. So both when it comes to body bags and when it comes to sanctions, Putin really will be taking a huge step into the dark. You mentioned the sanctions there. How, how damaging could those sanctions to be could, could be to Russia, given that... Um, it seems to have prepared well for this with its large uh, uh, foreign, foreign exchange reserves. Um, and th th this, is, this has figured into Putin's thinking, hasn't it, that, that the West would respond uh, with sanctions uh, and, and he's made preparations for that. So how, how damaging would they be in the long run? Well, you're right to note that Putin has a big rainy day fund. It's about $630 billion. He's also taken steps since 2014 to try to immunize the Russian economy, in part by building domestic sources of production, in part by deepening his ties to China. But depending on the, the sanctions that the West imposes, I think you are looking at a very big hit to the Russian economy. We're talking about taking Russian banks out of commercial markets preventing Russia from floating its own debt on international markets, banning the sale of technology that keeps Russian consumers able to buy things like cell phones, maybe turning off the spigot when it comes to energy, although that could be uh, more painful to Europe than, than to Russia. So it depends upon what menu of sanctions is, is, is chosen for, but we are looking at a potential major hit to the Russian economy. Good to get your uh, perspective on this. Uh, Charles Kupchin joining us there from Washington. My pleasure.